Hello, I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. Tonight, I'll be joined by our speaker, Dr. Kate Darling, who joins us from the MIT Media Lab in Boston. For several years, she's been studying the way humans and computers and AI interact, and today she's going to be talking to us about a potentially new paradigm, about the way we might think about that interaction. She's also going to be talking about the way this is presented in her book, The New Breed. Welcome, Dr. Kate Darling. Thank you so much, Xander. It is so great to be here. So I love robots. I love robots more than I love spiked lemonade. But I have a three and a half year old and a newborn baby at home. And ever since I had kids, people will say something to me. They'll say, Kate, you must find it so interesting to watch your children's brains develop and watch them learn about the world, given that you study robots. Now, I love this. I think it's a great conversation starter. It's wonderful that people ask this question, given that they know that I love robots so much. But I am here today to tell you both why we so automatically and instinctively compare robots to ourselves, to humans, and also why I think that that's the wrong way to think about robots and artificial intelligence as we move into the future. Now, another question I get a lot is, what is a robot? There is actually no universal definition of the word robot. People have different definitions depending on the field that they come from, and people have different images in their minds of what the word robot actually is. I operate with the same definition as most roboticists, which is a robot is a physical thing, so not AI or a bot. It has to be physical. It can sense the world. It can take in information, think about what to do next based on what it has sensed about the world, and then it can act on its environment again. Now, that sounds pretty good, but when you drill down on that definition, it gets a little fuzzy at the edges. I remember when I first got to MIT and I was so excited to see the truly cutting edge work being done in robotics. You know, the robots that we've been told over and over again are gonna take everyone's jobs and take over the world. Uh, and I quickly discovered that there's a massive discrepancy between the public perception of where the world is in robotics and where we actually are. So from what I've seen, trust me, for most robots, if you ever feel threatened, you can just dump a bucket of water over them and you should be absolutely fine. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be thinking about what robots mean for the future of work, for the future of humanity. That's something that I think about a lot. I just come at it from a slightly different perspective on our future. And that starts with a unique aspect of robots that I'm especially interested in, which is our self-projection. For example, something that I think is fascinating is the fact that there's a Japanese manufacturing company that will have its employees do exercises in the morning to warm up their bodies for their day on the assembly line. And this company, which also has robots working in the factory, will have the robots do the same exercises with their arms in order to be perceived more like colleagues and less as machines. Isn't that a little bit weird? Or I think it's interesting that when Boston Dynamics released the following video, everyone in robotics watched this video and said, wow, the robot didn't fall over. But then there were quite a lot of other people who watched this who expressed more negative emotions about what was happening in the video. Um, and it actually got to the point where PETA, the animal rights organization, was getting so many phone calls that they had to issue a press statement. Now, PETA didn't really care much about this. They said they weren't going to lose any sleep over this because it wasn't a real dog. But I'm interested in this. I am interested in the fact that despite all knowledge to the contrary, people will consciously or subconsciously treat robots like living things. Now, I was at a conference a couple of years ago getting a spiked lemonade at the bar, and I met this guy. Let's call him Scott, because that was his name. And Scott asked me what I was interested in, and I said, I'm interested in the fact that people consciously or subconsciously treat robots like living things. And Scott said, eh, I don't buy it. We talked for a long time over lemonade. I could not convince him. So Scott's perspective was this. This is a generational issue, he said. Sure, maybe our generation, we grew up with Star Wars. Maybe we will reflexively apologize when we stumble over a delivery robot on the sidewalk. Maybe we'll name all of our robots. But newer generations that grow up with this technology everywhere, they're going to treat robots just like any other device. Now, like I said, I could not convince Scott of this as we parted ways. But look, 
Sure, part of this is the influence of science fiction and pop culture, and part of it is the novelty of the technology. So in 2015, when this hitchhiking robot got beat up in Philadelphia, <laughs> people were really upset about it, but they might have been upset about it because they had never seen a hitchhiking robot before and they really got into that narrative. But there's a piece to our perception of robots that goes deeper than that. And that is our anthropomorphism. We have this inherent tendency to project human-like traits, qualities, emotions onto non-humans. We do this especially to animals. Uh, people will project emotions onto their pets that may or may not actually be there. In fact, science <laughs> shows often that we get it completely wrong and that the animals don't have the emotions that we believe that they do. Uh, but it's not just living things. We will project onto things that are created in the image of something lifelike, like a stuffed animal. We will see faces in random objects or car headlights. We do this from a very, very early age. One of the first things that infants learn to recognize is faces. And they don't even have to be real faces. They can just be black and white images on a screen. So this is very ingrained in us. We do this in order to interpret the world around us and make sense of our world and relate to anything around us. And one of the things that we also respond very strongly to is movement. Studies show that our brains are constantly scanning our environments and trying to separate things into objects and agents. And that makes sense evolutionarily because we had to watch out for the agents in the past. But what's happening now is we have this new kind of object that moves like an agent. And that tricks our brains into projecting intent and life onto any of this movement that we can't quite anticipate what it's going to do next. And you see this happen even with the most simple robots. Take the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Not the most sophisticated robot in the world. It's basically just a disc that moves around your floor to clean it. But the fact that, it, that it's moving around on its own will cause people to name the Roomba. Over 80% of Roombas have names. I don't know the statistics for your regular handheld Dyson. I guarantee you they're lower. People will feel bad for the Roomba when it gets stuck somewhere. I was visiting the company that makes the Roomba a few years ago, and they had all these stories of people who would send in their Roombas for repair, and they would turn down the offer of a brand new replacement vacuum saying, no, we want you to fix Meryl Sweep and send her back to us. Now, a more extreme example of this is military robots. There have been these bomb disposal units that the United States military has used in Iraq and Afghanistan. They are designed to let soldiers hang back out of harm's way. A lot of them are just remote controlled and only partially autonomous, but soldiers will treat them like pets. They gave them names, they gave them medals of honor, they would hold funerals with gun salutes for them when they couldn't be repaired. There are even some stories of soldiers risking their lives to save uh, the robots on the battlefield that they didn't want to leave behind. Peter Singer writes about this in his book, Wired for War. Now, the interesting thing here is that these robots, like the Roomba, are not designed to look like anything special. They're basically just sticks on treads, and they're already having this effect. And that brings me to the element of design that can enhance this even further. Now, there are a lot of robots out there that move in very biologically inspired ways, the reason for this is often practical. So Boston Dynamics is a company that makes very biologically inspired robots. The reason that they do this is practical. Animals have evolved over billions of years to be really efficient in navigating different terrains. So it makes sense to borrow from that anatomy when we are trying to design robot locomotion. But it's also very, very difficult to watch these robots move around and not feel like they have some sort of agency. Now, at the end of that conference where I met my lemonade friend, Scott, we actually bumped into each other again. This was this robotics and space conference. There were a lot of demos. And Scott said that he had seen a demo that made him think more about this. And the thing he had seen was this uh, very biologically inspired dragonfly robot. So it had wings and it could fly around um, and it looked like a dragonfly. And the thing that he noticed was not the robot, but the people in the room watching the robot. He said that they were totally transfixed. They could not take their eyes off of this thing that was buzzing around their heads. And he said, you know what, Kate? Maybe you're right. Maybe we are built this way. But I still don't buy it. And I said, oh, come on, man. But we shook hands and we decided that the next few decades are gonna be very, very interesting to watch because this is something that can be designed intentionally. And that's what social robotics is all about. Social robots are robots 
that are intentionally designed to mimic cues, movements, sounds, whatever, that people automatically subconsciously associate with states of mind. And this works really well. Um, I first got really into this topic when I bought a toy called a Pleo. It's a baby dinosaur robot that came out in 2007. So this is the Pleo. The Pleo is a very cool toy that I initially bought because it has all these cool motors and touch sensors and an infrared camera in the snout. And it mimics lifelike behavior really well. And one of the things it has is a tilt sensor. So it'll know what direction it's facing. And I thought this was, was really cool and I would show it off to my friends and I would tell my friends to hold it up by the tail because this is what happens when you hold the Pleo up by the tail. It mimics pain and distress. So I would show this off to my friends and some of my friends held it up for a really long time and watched it squirm. And that started to make me uncomfortable. I realized I would ask people to put it back down and say, that's enough, put him back down. And then I would pet the robot to make it stop crying. And that was really interesting because I knew exactly how the robot worked and I still felt compelled to comfort it. So that sparked a curiosity in me. And fast forward a few years, I did a workshop with my friend Hannes Gosseld at a conference called Lyft in Geneva. We took five of these baby dinosaur robots. We gave them to five groups of people. We had each group name their robot and play with it, interact with it. We had them do a little fashion show with the robots where they dressed them up in pipe cleaners and construction paper, just so that we could personify them a little. And then after about 45 minutes to an hour, we unveiled a hammer and a hatchet and a knife, and we told them to torture and kill the robots. Now this turned out to be pretty dramatic. We obviously wanted it to be dramatic, but uh, it turned out to be more dramatic than we expected it to be. We had initially thought, okay, there's probably gonna be a split of people in the room. Some people are gonna say, oh, so what? It's just a robot. And some people are gonna have more of a problem with the violence. Uh, and we wanted to ratchet up the violence and see how the split in the room changed. And instead, everyone just absolutely refused to even hit the baby dinosaur robots. We finally had to threaten to destroy all of the robots unless someone took a hatchet to one of them. And this poor guy volunteered and we all stood in a circle around him and he brought the hatchet down on the, on the robot's neck and people kind of winced and looked away. And then there was this half joking, half serious moment of silence in the room for the fallen robot. So that was a really interesting day. Now, this wasn't science. This was not a scientific experiment. This was not a controlled setting. There were a lot of social dynamics, uh, but it inspired some later research that I did at MIT with my colleagues, Cynthia Brazil and Palash Nandi. And for this research, instead of using really cute, evocative baby dinosaurs, we used something much more simple. We used hex bugs, which are these toys that move around like insects in a lifelike way, but they're very basic and simple. And we had people come into the lab and smash them with mallets. And we wanted to know two things. So we wanted to know, would people hesitate more to hit the hex bugs if, like we do so often with robots, we give them a name and a backstory. So we say, this is Frank. Frank's favorite color is red. He likes to play. And then the second thing we wanted to know was how people's hesitation to hit the hex bugs related to their natural tendencies for empathy. So we did psychological empathy testing with people, and we found that people who scored low on empathic concern for others in general, they didn't seem to care much about Frank. They would just hit Frank. And people who scored higher on empathic concern, they would hesitate more or sometimes even refuse to hit the hex bugs. So that was just a little study but it is part of a large and growing body of research in human-robot interaction that shows that we respond genuinely to the cues that these machines give us, and we respond even if we know perfectly well that none of this is real. Okay, so why does this matter? I think it matters because what's happening right now all over the world is that robots are moving from being kind of behind the scenes in factories, manufacturing, behind walls and cages, and they're coming into shared spaces, spaces where they are interacting with people, 
workplaces, households, public areas. So we have these machines that can sense and think and make autonomous decisions and learn, and they're not alive and they can't feel, but people feel differently about them than they do about other devices. And that is such an important thing to understand as we start to integrate this technology, that people treat it differently. And in some ways, this is even really useful. We are already seeing some pretty cool applications in health and education that specifically rely on people treating a robot like a living thing or like a social actor on them even de developing an emotional connection to a robot. So for example, there's some very intriguing research on autistic children and using robots as a tool in therapy. And the robots in this context aren't used as a replacement for a therapist or a parent. It, the robots are actually facilitating conversations between the child and the adult in the room. And the researchers aren't quite sure why robots are so useful in this context, but they think it's because for these kids, the robot is clearly something social for any of us. A robot, we will treat it like something social, but the kids also understand that the robot doesn't come with all of the baggage of humans. And so it, it can actually facilitate some of the conversations that we want to be having. Now, it's not just in this context. There are also a lot of studies being run on using robots in education, using robots to help kids be more curious about different aspects of learning. And again, this is not to replace teachers, but rather to be used as a su supplemental additional tool in a classroom setting. And then there's therapy robots like the Paro Baby Seal that's used in nursing homes and with dementia patients. This one has been around for a while. It's a very, very cute baby harp seal robot. It responds to your touch. It makes these little movements and sounds. It's pretty simple, but it has quite an effect on the people who use it. Um, it lowers their blood pressure. It can calm them. It gives them the sense of nurturing something in a context where their lives have been reduced to being taken care of by others. Now, the first response that I often get to Paro is, oh my gosh, Kate, I can't believe that we are living in a dystopia where we give people robots instead of human care. I think that that's a very um, justified thing to say uh, because we shouldn't be replacing human caretakers with robots. That's a terrible idea. Uh, but here's where I want to point out what I think is a huge problem in a lot of our conversations around robots, in our casual conversations, in our news media, even among roboticists themselves. And that is that we often subconsciously compare robots to humans and artificial intelligence to human intelligence. Now, of course we do this, given everything that I've just told you about how we anthropomorphize robots and project ourselves onto them. But we do it constantly. We do it in our stock photo images. If you Google image search artificial intelligence, you get a bunch of images of human brains and humanoid robots and human heads. But we do this also in our conversations about robots replacing jobs one-to-one. -one. We do this in our conversations about intelligence, like comparing my children's brains to, to AI. But this analogy does not make any sense at all. So on the one hand, we already have robots that are smarter than people. We have robots that can do endless calculations, that can beat us at chess, at Go, at Jeopardy, that can recognize patterns in data that we would never see. And then on the other hand, people are also much, much smarter than machines. It used to be that if you asked Apple's voice assistant, Siri, to call you an ambulance, she would literally call you an ambulance because she didn't understand the context. Now, of course, Apple fixed this once it became known, but they probably had to fix it by hand because Siri, even today, if you try to have a conversation with her, you will probably give up pretty quickly. That's not to say that machines aren't smart. It's not to say that they're not becoming smarter. It's to say that machines understand and see and learn about the world differently than we do. And so the question to me is not, can we eventually at some point in the future recreate human intelligence? The question to me is, why would we want to do that in the first place when we can create something different? So it shouldn't be our goal to recreate ourselves. It, it's actually more useful to create something that's supplemental. And I actually just wrote a book called The New Breed that tries to challenge and break this mold of subconsciously thinking of robots like humans by offering a different analogy. 
This is an analogy that is familiar to us, that acknowledges that robots are different from toasters in that they can make their own decisions and learn about the world. And it's one that changes some of these conversations in what I think are pretty important ways. So if we come back to the baby seal robot, the Paro, Paro is not designed to replace human caregivers. What Paro is designed to replace is animal therapy in contexts where we can't use real animals for reasons of health and hygiene and safety, but we can use the robot and it works because people will consistently treat the robot more like an animal than a device. And it's not just in the social robotics context. If you think about it, throughout history, we've used animals for work, for weaponry, for companionship. We domesticated them because their skill sets are different from ours, not because they do what we do, because they're different and that's useful. We've used oxen to plow our fields for millennia. We've used horses to travel the world in new ways. Here is the original hobby photography drone. In the early 1900s, there was a German pharmacist who was using pigeons to deliver medicine, which is something we're starting to do with drones in remote locations today. And one day he had the wild idea to put cameras on the pigeons to see if they could take aerial photographs. And it turns out they could. And of course, later the CIA adopted this to create spy pigeons. But pigeons also delivered mail for thousands of years, letting us communicate with each other in totally new ways. Now, animals not only have physical abilities, but also sensing abilities that are way better than ours and incredibly useful. This, for example, is an official United States Navy echolocation device. In the 60s and 70s, both the United States and the Soviet Navy started marine mammal training programs because marine mammals have amazing echolocation systems. So they use them to detect lost underwater equipment and mines. There's some rumors that they strapped harpoons to them and made them into weapons as well. But the United States also used both robots and dolphins in the Gulf Wars to look for mines. Um, and in fact, the dolphin program is still in place because even though they've tried to phase out the dolphins and replace them with robots, the dolphins are still in many ways better than the technology. Here's also the um, original sensory equipment used in the mines, the canary in the coal mine. And I could go on and on, right? There are so many examples of how we are using robots today in roles that we've previously used animals in. But the point that I wanna make is not that animals and robots are the same. The point that I wanna make is that moving away from this constant quasi-human comparison opens our minds to new possibilities. It's a really useful thought exercise. It helps challenge the idea that robots and AI can, will, or should replace people. The true potential of robotics and artificial intelligence is not to recreate what we already have. It's for us to partner with these technologies and what we're trying to achieve. I think this human comparison also lends itself to some rhetoric that's pretty misleading. So over the past five decades, you've probably seen some headlines that look like this. No jobs, blame the robots. Well, that headline would be a little more accurate if it was no jobs, blame company decisions driven by unbridled corporate capitalism. Not such a pithy headline, but more accurate because it's not the robots taking the jobs, right? Thinking of robots as quasi-humans, giving them this agency in our language really lends itself to a determinism about our future and about the automation of labor, when in reality, we have choices. We don't like to see this, but we have choices. We could be using technology to help people do a better job rather than trying to automate them away. If you look at warehouse workers today, it's kind of like that Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times, where companies have automated as much of the process as they can. And so they're treating the human workers like a part of the machine. The, they have scan guns that count down the seconds between tasks. They make them do things that they are clearly hoping that they can eventually automate once the technology gets better. But that's not the only way to think about or handle human labor like a replaceable commodity. So take, for example, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I know that a lot of patent and trademark offices are dealing with the problem that you have patent examiners that get tons of applications on their desk. They need to decide whether any invention is new enough to warrant patent protection. And so technically they have to sift through all of the world's information in order to make that determination, which is impossible. And so, you know, one of the things that the United States Patent and Trademark Office could have done, which I have seen companies do, is they could have said, hmm, I wonder if we could train artificial intelligence 
on you know the historic data that we have and have it make determinations that are you know have a slightly better hit rate than the examiners because even if it's just slightly better than the very poor job that we're doing right now then we can get rid of all these people and not have to pay them their salaries no instead what they said was how can we use this technology to help our people do a better job and so they started looking for ways to use ai to surface some of the prior art that the examiners wouldn't have found on their own and then letting the humans do what they do best which is make that judgment call that determination so how can we use robots to help people do a better job rather than replace them? How can we use robots to help people be more productive, to leverage what people are good at and enjoy doing while automating the things that robots are good at, which tend to be the uncreative, dirty, dangerous, or dull things that people don't like doing anyway. Now, unfortunately, while employers could be thinking creatively about supporting workers, whether that's in their current jobs or supporting them through transitions because this still requires a lot of disruption to our current way of doing things. These choices are driven by a broader political and economic system that sets short-term corporate profit incentives and does treat workers like a commodity. And that is a, a really, really difficult thing to address and change. But that's the conversation we should be having. Instead of this, the robots are coming for our jobs, technological determinism that I see everywhere. Now, another area where I think we can and need to shift the conversation is when we talk about law, specifically responsibility for harm. I have seen too many lawyers argue that we are currently at a unique moment in history because we are developing machines that can make their own decisions, some of which not even the creators or users could anticipate. Uh, and to deal with the problem, a lot of the proposed solutions are along the lines of, can we hold the robots themselves accountable, either by programming them with certain baked in rules or ethics, or the EU has even had a proposal to create an electronic personhood to be able to make the machines themselves responsible. Now, that's not completely out of left field because we've created personhood for corporations and other non-humans, but I think we don't talk enough currently about how there is legal precedent for unanticipated autonomous behavior. We've had to deal with the question of responsibility for animal-caused harm ever since the beginning of laws known to humankind that dealt with what happens if your ox wanders off into the street and gores somebody unexpectedly. Whose fault is that? Who has to pay for that? And different societies had different answers depending on their culture. But the point is, we have this whole smorgasbord of ways that we have dealt with autonomously caused harm in the past, and we should be drawing on some of that when we think about this in the future. Again, the point is not that robots and animals are the same. The point is that thinking about this analogy gives us some different options, and most importantly, it helps us start from a different place. Because when you compare robots to animals, it suddenly feels very different to argue that they should be accountable. We don't expect animals to abide by our rules and moral codes. A zoo can't let the tiger wander around the zoo freely and then when it eats someone, point to the tiger and say, oh, well, you know, we couldn't, how could we anticipate that? We trained it to be really nice. We did our best. Um, but we're already seeing corporations and governments try to distance themselves from responsibility and blame the algorithms in their rhetoric when something goes wrong. And that worries me. Because in the past, some of our analogies for technology have actually influenced some of our law and policy. So two researchers, Richards and Smart, call the human-robot comparison the android fallacy. And I think that that is happening here, and we need to be very aware of it. Now, I do not think that it is possible to get rid of our anthropomorphism. I do think we need to be, like I said, appropriately aware of it, and we need to guide it where we can. For example, when we're talking about liability, for example, when we're talking about the future of work. But I think what it also means is that we're going to see certain things happen as robots become more part of our daily lives. For example, socially. If you think about it, throughout history, we've treated most animals like tools and products, and some animals as companions. I think it's entirely plausible that we're going to start doing the same thing with robots, treat most of them like tools and products and some of them like our companions. Now, we know what Scott would say to this, and here's what I wanna to say to Scott. Look, maybe you're right. Maybe once robots are ubiquitous, we will treat them just like any other device, but I just don't buy it. 
And I think that the research on human robot interaction is not only interesting, but important. I think that what's most fascinating to me about this research is that it's teaching us more about ourselves. It's teaching us about human psychology, empathy, how we relate to others. If we look at the history of animal rights, for example, it doesn't really match the philosophical reasons that a lot of us believe in, like preventing suffering. Our actual history shows that we care way more about preventing certain types of human behavior or protecting the animals that we have an emotional or a cultural relationship to. When it comes to animals, we don't truly care as much about inherent criteria like consciousness or suffering, even though we think that we do and we want to, many of us, and we've kind of ignored that hypocrisy. But what human-robot interaction research can do is hold up a mirror and make us confront some uncomfortable truths about ourselves. One of which may be that we care more about a fluffy baby seal robot than a living, breathing, slimy slug. Now that's not to say that we can't shift our behavior if we don't like being this way, but it requires seeing it. Acknowledging our social tendencies helps us better navigate technology integration, and it's also helping us see, I think, some of the real issues that we may be facing in the near future. Because what keeps me up at night is not robot takeovers. It's privacy and data security. It's the ways that robots could be used to manipulate people, not just for their own benefit in healthcare and education, but for someone else's benefit. So setting aside some of our moral panic and our determinism about the future, really helps us be more clear-eyed about our challenges and about our choices. It helps us think outside of the box. It helps us lean into the positives. And it helps us intentionally build technology with the goal of benefiting people. And if we can do that, then I, for one, am excited to welcome our new robot partners and to work together to shape a future that supports human flourishing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. That was really great. And I would like to welcome you on live from your home in Boston. Hi. To, good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, that was fantastic. And I think this way of thinking about robotics is a much more helpful paradigm um, than the one that we're all used to. And, you know, I've, I've built robots for the TV show BattleBots and there's, there's, and you know, when these robots get destroyed, there is often this kind of funny empathy thing that happens um, every, from everywhere, from the builders to the audience. And, you know, I've seen kids, you know, run up to me and be like, how could you have let that happen? <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a, a funny moment because it's the purpose is the destruction of the robots. Uh, but I think I like this a lot better. Um, one, I think at the beginning of your talk, you had some of the video of the dancing robots. And I think, you know, this is this thing that, um, you know, robotics companies love to make demos that make their robots seem more lifelike. Um, yet those are, you know, when you look at it in contrast to the, the DARPA grand challenge in an unscripted environment where they're falling down, trying to open a door, you realize that there's a really big difference. Like the robots are generally not listening to the music that are dancing. Right. Um, but why do you suppose robotics companies are trying to change, you know, they're trying to change this perception, even though it, I think in some cases works against them in the, in the world. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I think they're kind of trapped because they need to raise money, right? So <laughs> they have to, they have to, you know, put forth a product that, um, you know, looks useful or cool, and or or at least a vision of what the product will be in the near future, near enough future for investors to want to invest in that, right? So if you're a company, you you very much have to follow the money. Um, but yeah, I you know I I do want to say uh, Boston Dynamics has a really bad reputation, but I know that they take great pride in their videos actually being accurate, uh, in in the sense that they are not um, what what you see in the video actually happened. Like it's not right. you know sped up or staged in in a weird way. What I think the problem is is that in people's minds if a robot can do one thing then it can do other things too uh, we have this idea of intelligence as being general intelligence like our own and and skills being more general and that's what you see at the darpa challenge that as soon as you take a robot and have it try to do multiple tasks it will fail because we're just not there yet we can only create these single task devices and so you know the companies create these cool videos and people have their own interpretations of, oh, well, if the robot can dance, then it can also 
you know, open the door and escape or come and, you know, kill my family in our sleep, uh, which is not quite accurate. Right. And that's the part that I think is interesting. Well, that while the following the money in one way, but where when public perception becomes the robots are dangerous or potentially dangerous, then it's kind of working against them. Um, so it's I guess it remains to be seen what the, the smart way to to do this is. Um, yeah, I was after hearing your talk, I was reminded of uh, I was driving through San Francisco and I was going by a park and there was this new robotic lawnmower that was going down on um, mowing this lawn of the park. But then like 20 feet behind it is this guy operating the robot, which I thought was really odd, right? Because they've now taken a job that was a blue collar entry level job that it was a guy riding the mower and replaced it with probably someone that costs four times as much per hour who's now a robot technician driving the robot 40 feet behind it. And I was very like, they're not gonna just unleash, you know, robotic lawnmower robots in parks in San Francisco around humans. So clearly there's this human thing that where, and I've seen this over and over again, where actually robotics and being introduced really just makes jobs that were entry level or blue collar into robotics engineer jobs, which are kind of more difficult to fill and more expensive. And I wonder what your thoughts are on, on this kind of, the way that you know robots are kind of being moved into our lives, I think for a technological demo reason, instead of the truly saving of time and money reason. Oh, that's so well put. I think that is true that we are seeing a lot of robots as, you know, technological demos or just, you know, PR uh, to dr draws for attention and people because they can't actually replace jobs. I do want to push back a little bit on the idea that it always goes in the direction of, well, now someone operating the robot is a higher skilled worker because you also have the case where, you know, you have the self checkout things at grocery stores that are always malfunctioning and you have someone there who's performing the labor of helping the customers navigate the, you know, the technologies that's not working properly. And sometimes that is invisible labor that doesn't even get compensated. Like suddenly you, you have people doing more work or, like more annoying work that doesn't ever get seen. Uh, we also, and I don't know if you have been to a stop and shop on the East Coast. This is a grocery store that we have. Um, we have these robots named Marty that roam the aisles that are six feet tall and they have these googly eyes. And all the robot does is um, it tries to detect hazards on the floor and then alert an employee to come clean the hazard. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I've, I and uh, one of my students, Daniela Di Paola, have spent a lot of time in Stop and Shop watching this robot and watching it, you know, flag people to come over for tiny pieces of cilantro and watch the employees like walk over and sigh heavily and like press a button on the robot to make it keep going. So, you know, you have, I, I would say the most ideal case of this uh, disruption is if you have a robot like the lawnmower robot and then you have the person who was previously driving the lawnmower you train them to be able to operate the robot. And that happens sometimes. That's happened with some of the sewer robots in India. Um, but I think that's really what we want. We want to be able to train people so that they can have a more fulfilling job. Um, and instead of either getting rid of them and hiring someone who's higher, you know, has more qualifications or, you know, having them do <laughs> the horrible cleanup work without getting compensated. Thanks. Um, and we're going to be bringing in Kevin Kelly, one of the founders of Long Now and the senior, senior maverick at Wired. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing that shortly. Um, but I had a great question um, from Juan on the YouTube feed. Um, what do you think about the robotic augmented experiences to, created to let humans explore a darker side of their of their own personality, something like we saw portrayed in Westworld? Oh, so yeah. So <laughs> Westworld is um, very interesting to me because, you know, I've done so much work around violence and empathy with robots. And I think that the question of, you know, what happens once we can build a theme park where we have robots that, you know, we, we might not have quite the same level of Westworld, but we already have robots that can mimic pain and distress. And what if you had a theme park where people can go and do whatever they want to them? Is that something that is a healthy outlet for violent or behavior. Even at home, a robot that would be. Used oh yeah, for. or at home, a robot that you can just beat up. I mean, it's great. Now you're not beating up a human, right? Is that is that a healthy thing that we should provide to people, or is it, as someone once said to me, training your cruelty muscles? And we don't know the answer to this. It's kind of like the violence in video games question, but it's on a 
new level because we are such physical creatures and this is very visceral to us. So I think it is definitely a question worth asking. And I think it's a question that we will be asking as these robots come more into our lives and have more lifelike behavior. Excellent. And I welcome Kevin Kelly. Hi. Hey, Kevin. It's hey. really great. Kate, I, I think your book is fantastic, uh, The New Breed, and um, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, just picking off of the previous question, one thing, I don't think you got to the book, in, in the book exactly, but it's very related, which is um, the idea of treating robots as slaves. And I think it doesn't really affect them, but treating them as slaves would be very corrosive for us. And, and that, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you've thought about that. It's not even about being violent. It's just this idea that they are our slaves. They do whatever we said want. We command them to do this or that. And so that kind of slave relationship might be, again, it may not affect them at all, but it could be very corrosive to us. And so I think that's some of the things you're kind of exploring in your book about the violence and other things is that setting aside their own, the robot's own, ability to apprehend us, the effect is mostly about us. I mean, yeah, I totally agree with you that the question is how it affects us and not how it affects the robots since they, you know, are very far ways away from feeling anything right. if ever. Um, the reason I can tell you the reason why I did not really address the slavery topic in the book, mm -hmm. which is that I, I find that it lets you then easily fall back into the human comparison. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I also find it honestly a little bit problematic to um, compare human rights movements with kind of the robot rights and ethical mm -hmm. things that I talk about because it kind of neglects the historical and, and current context that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, you know, the, the reason that animal rights are such a good analogy and slavery is is useful in some contexts but maybe not completely is because it's it seems to be at least clear to us on some level that you know humans have the same capacity for feeling pain or being conscious uh, we might not agree on what pain or consciousness is but we kind of agree that humans generally have kind of the same abilities for that mm -hmm. uh, whereas animals you know, there's a wide range of different types of intelligence and consciousness and do they feel pain? Is it okay to eat fish if they don't have any feelings, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a more accurate comparison to the wide range of AI and robotics that we're going to see and the questions that we're going to be facing if we're talking about, um, you know, is a robot conscious? Does a robot deserve you know, certain mm -hmm. treatment? Which robots deserve better treatment than others? I think we're going to quickly fall back on these um, kind of similar arguments that we've seen in animal rights. And then it's all going to be irrelevant because we're just going to follow our emotions anyway. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're introducing the idea of um, a better model for us thinking about these varieties and pluralities of how artificial intelligence is embodied into robots is to think of them as animals, either pets or domesticated workers. And um, what's interesting to me about, about your suggestion is that, um, as you note in the book, that once you begin to look at our own um, ideas about animal rights, we're totally conflicted and we're completely inconsistent. I mean, basically, if you eat meat and are concerned about animal rights, you're a hypocrite, right? I mean, in some senses, because we don't know what animal intelligence is like. We don't know what their consciousness is like. We, we we don't know so many things. So it's very, very messy. And at first I thought, well, that's like, um, that's like a bug, but actually that might be, that it might actually be the feature. The whole point of treating things like uh, these uh, uh, robots, like animals is because we don't know what intelligence is in machines either. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't have any idea. And so we can take this model where it's already messy and we don't know what we're doing and we apply it to the robots to help us figure out what it is that we're thinking about. So it's a kind of like a really great first step. Is that kind of the thesis? Of that yours? is absolutely what the third part of the book was trying to, to go for. That it's That's why this is a useful analogy because it, you know, let's take a step back from these conversations about you know, what is consciousness in AI and, and look at 
you know, historically how we've dealt with animals, this other being that can sense and think and make autonomous de decisions and learn. And what we've what we've learned is we don't we don't have any answers there either. So it's a good place to start. Yeah. So I, I have one last question, which is um, in the book, you spent a lot of time kind of talking about the interesting history of animal rights and their le legal status and other approaches that we've had to companionship from the Western perspective. But it's my observation that the people who are really going to be deciding about these things are probably going to be Asians, the 10 times people in India and China who are probably going to manufacture and manufacture these and maybe even sell them. And so what have you found out about how their views on this, since they are probably going to be the people who maybe decide um, and whether they have any different views than us? Yeah, I, I very much focused and very much made clear that I focused on the Western perspective in the book and that there are many other perspectives that would be very helpful to look at. Um, I do, like my very limited experience with Japanese culture has been extremely illuminating when it comes to how we view uh, or could view robots in ways mm -hmm. other than how we view them here in the West, because um, uh, there, there are cult I mean, in, in Japan, with a history of Shintoism and treating objects uh, like they have a soul mm -hmm. and not really distinguishing between living things and non-living things, I think that that is one of the reasons that um, the Japanese have a, has, tend to have a very different attitude towards robots and yeah. view them not so much as something that's coming to, uh, I don't know, something creepy that's coming to replace us, but rather mm -hmm. something that they just kind of fit into society the way that they've mm -hmm. fit sewing needles and rocks into society. So I think that there absolutely needs to be much more work done and there need to be many more voices from other cultures teaching us, again, different ways of thinking about robots and conceptualizing them in order to move us away from this quasi-human analogy and some of the tropes that we so easily fall into. Yeah, well, it's great work. I highly recommend people follow up and thank you for your fantastic talk. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kevin. That was great. Um, one other thing, I mean, I think we have, you know, we have certain types of lessons where, where robots have crept into our lives and taken over things that actually do take a human job, but it seems to have been fine. I think we talked a little bit earlier about things like washing machines and, you know, clothes washing machines, as well as, uh, dishwashing machines, where I know here at, here at our bar, if the dishwasher goes down, we have to hire a human that night to start washing dishes. So it's a, it's a true replacement, but, um, you know, what, what do you think is the reason that those robots that have crept into our lives? Um, and do human tasks are seem to be, we don't seem to have empathy for them. When they don't work, we hate them. <laughs> we, don't, we don't feel bad for them. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Well, yeah, I, I think it has to do with our very messy definition of what a robot is, right? Uh, sometimes it's any new fancy technology that has some sort of uh, like automatic, can do it something automatically is a robot. Um, and then once it becomes more integrated into our lives or workplaces, it becomes a tool like a dishwasher. Um, and I also think it gets to our, uh, you know, the weird ways that we treat some robots like they're alive and some robots like tools and uh, depending on their function, it depends a lot on the design. I talked a lot about design, but it also kind of depends on the function. So yes, we've had, we've had a lot of technological disruption <laughs> And uh, it's it's funny how we focus so much on robots and artificial intelligence as like this major disruptor that's so different from the other disruptors. And I think that has a lot to do with our own fears and less to do with the technology itself. Yeah, no, yeah, indeed. It seems like there's certainly no, you know, no real feelings for the office printer when it goes down other than hatred. <laughs> and so it's, that seems to be uh, a different type of robot for sure. Um, and uh, one of the questions from the feed, from our YouTube feed from Anton, um, he's asking, you know, how, how and when should we allow robots to say no to us? Is there, is there an ethics of when robots should answer no to a human request? That's a really good question. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the first time I encountered this was there was this radio lab podcast years ago like over 10 years ago um and they interviewed freedom baird who was a roboticist at the media lab who way preceded me um and she had bought a furby and she she carried the furby around with her and when it when the furby 
the, the old Furby, I think the new Furby too, but when they get flipped upside down, they say, me no like, uh, and they start to protest. So they start to say no, or they start to tell you to do something differently. Um, and so she realized that that made her feel bad and she would take the Furby out and put it back upright. And uh, so, so she started thinking more about how we react to robots. Um, but the, yeah, it's a, it's a question that toy designers are already facing. Like, do you design a toy that says, ow, that hurt me when you hit it, please stop. Uh, or do you design it to not react? And I, I think it very much depends on the situation, but it's something that we need to be very sensitive to because you know, in some ways saying no <laughs> might even lend itself to people then wanting to torture it even more in some cases. And is that good? Are you then training people to override consent? Uh, I think we just need to be really careful, especially when it comes to kids as to, you know, how how these interactions are, are being monitored um, and how we design these toys. And, and the first step is really understanding that we do subconsciously treat them like living things. Yeah, I mean, obviously the Asimov's three laws kind of in some way cover this, right? Of like, you know, you can't train a robot to hurt another human. That's where a robot's supposed to say no, right? Um, so that's one of those places. And I'm wondering, those three laws are, are, they've been kind of amazingly useful in thinking about robots, even just in films and things like that, as we imagine our future. Is there, is there thoughts on more robotics laws or a more any consortiums of roboticists that are talking about this as a broad field that we need to, you know, have have good robot laws? Well, to me, I mean, the usefulness of the laws is the fact that Asimov showed over and over again how they don't work, right? They, you know. <laughs> Where they fail. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, what it really, what it, what it illustrates is how complicated it is to rely on the programming of the machine to follow any kind of rules that we give it, especially if that's like an ethical or moral code, which we haven't even agreed on as humans. So it's, I, I think it's useful in that sense. Um, but people often forget that, right? <laughs> they forget that really the stories are about how the laws, how laws like that don't work. And they say, oh, maybe we can develop some laws like Asimov. So, <laughs> so it's kind of, I wonder, <laughs> you know, how he would feel about the fact that people have kind of taken that in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess they're, I mean, they're, they're useful thought experiments, but they're kind of most entertaining when they start getting broken. But, and I, I, but I did want to ask the, this question of, you know, where is the field of robotics and AI and talking to themselves about ways that we're going to do this? Is this a, you know, you know, early on in the, the, the biotech world, there was the Asilomar conference about the ethics of the way we're going to do synthetic biology. And I know there's been some conferences on this, but and now there's some institutes that are starting to talk about dangers of AI. Where do you think this is kind of fitting in and going? Or, you know, obviously, I think that's going to be different from country to country as well. But is there is there a way we should pay attention to or as consumers of robotics and AI encourage certain types of kind of ethical discussions that are happening in the field? Absolutely. And there has been a lot of it in the past few years. It's really grown into like I'm, I'm part of this conference called We Robot that talks about the legal and policy issues related to robotics, which is also often related to ethical issues. And um, when we started the conference 10 years ago, people thought we were kooks, right? Like, <laughs> what, are, what are they talking about? What is this science fiction stuff? And now it's like a, a huge thing because uh, AI ethics has blossomed into, uh, people are starting to understand how important it is as a field. Um, and it's so heartening to see so many roboticists and artificial intelligence researchers uh, kind of engage with, with this and understand that it's important. I, I mean, I see it in my workplace now where there's been this huge shift towards trying to incorporate more of that. Um, I think where I still see a problem is that there's not enough integration of uh, like cross-disciplinary integration. Um, we don't have enough you know, ethicists who really know how to work with engineers or engineers who know how to work with ethicists. Um, people are starting to try to throw people together and see what happens. Uh, but I think we're gonna go through some growing pains before we see some truly interdisciplinary action on this that uh, we ultimately need. I agree. Yeah, no, I mean, I think as as somebody who's, as I mentioned, built robots for for TV, I've certainly had these. You know, the first question out of so many reporters' mouths is, you know, so when are the robot overlords taking, you know, taking over? And you know, 
when you realize as somebody who makes robots that as you pointed out, it's it doesn't take much to defeat a robot in almost any, <laughs> in almost any circumstance, and so it's 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 always seems so far from from an experience of people who build these things that that they're going to take over because you spend so much time just getting them to work for like one or two minutes. Um, <laughs> it, it does not seem like the worry that there's going to be a takeover. Um, so uh, thank you so much for this. I, I want to ask you know this 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 book is fantastic and it's coming out and where are you where are you heading next with your research and thoughts on this stuff? I'd love to I'd love to hear about what you might be doing next. Well, we we had a bunch of experiments planned for the fall and now we're waiting to see because we are currently still in a global pandemic, uh, waiting to see if that's possible because, you know, um, my passion is <laughs> working with people and robots. And um, so, but uh, some of the experiments that I have queued up are around consumer protection and policy issues around emotional persuasion um, through robots. And also some, uh, just, it's, it, we live in such an interesting time. I mean, uh, especially where you are, where, where robots are coming out onto the streets. Uh, it, it's so interesting to see these robots that engineers have developed and like they've, they, they put so much effort into, like you said, like just getting them to function right. And then sometimes they just don't take into account what happens when you put the robot in, a, in an environment with people and psychology and emotions come into play. Um, and it's so funny to watch like some of the mistakes that are being made and some of the successes and to understand that human robot interaction as a field is really important and growing in importance as we try to integrate this technology. Yeah, it is. I've seen them on the street. I've seen people both help them and hurt them uh, these delivery robots on the street. So there seems to be definitely a mixed reaction to, to these things. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us and for this talk. Um, and I hope that at some point we can have you here for a spiked lemonade uh, here at the interval. Uh, we can have this discussion further. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, our audience, uh, and look forward to having you at one of our talks in the future. <laughs>